My guest today is James McKee. James, how are you? Doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing re really, really well. Uh, what do you do, James? So I am the Global Developer Security Program Manager at Trimble. Uh, my job is to help make sure that we produce uh, secure software products and really get developers to lean into software security. You are the security guy, aren't you? I mean, I, I say that because you, not only your job title has the word security in it, but, uh, uh, but you speak a lot at conferences like I, Nebraska last week. I, I've had a... Awesome. Uh, it, it's fantastic. Yeah, no, it's, it's awesome to get invited to those places, um, to have the opportunity to go speak to developers about software security. I've had the opportunity to, uh, to speak at developer conferences about cybersecurity. I've had the opportunity to speak about software development at security conferences. Um, and so it's a, it's a fun space to play in. A lot of really interesting people, a lot of really interesting kind of work that's being done right now. Yeah, and I think software developers, they understand that security is important. And most of them, the good ones, they, they, they understand about, they, they understand the concept of security, but they recognize, most of us recognize that we, we should know more, that we could know more. It's, it's a complex topic and there's a lot of tools involved. Oh, absolutely. I've, you know, I personally spent many, many years in this space, many as a developer, and then kind of following it up, many in the security space, specifically from the development side. And, uh, you know, whenever I sit down and I have a conversation with people, it's amazing to, to go through and talk about some of the things that go on. Because when you start talking about these problems, developers get really invested. Um, because it kind of inherently, this is a, um, you know, we all put our passion into developing software, right? If you're spending 40 to 60, maybe 80 hours a week building something, you want it to be the absolute best that you can can build and so um, security is kind of that black box for a lot of teams and so whenever you start to get the chance to talk to them at conferences where you've pulled them away from kind of the the day-to-day -day, hey we got to ship a feature and talk to them about cybersecurity, it really really pulls them in and when we were talking about doing this show you suggested a topic application security versus developer security which I if somebody gave me those two terms in my mind I would sort of think of them as synonyms but they're not, are they? No, no, no. And uh, this is a, it's a really interesting thing. And it's kind of, um, we'll call it a symptom of kind of the, the nature of cybersecurity and that kind of black box. Um, for a long time, we've wanted to solve cybersecurity. And so we've always, from a kind of business standpoint, wanted to go out and find a piece of software or something that would help us. And so we made huge investments in uh, static code analysis through either SAS tools or linting. Um, various other products, and through dynamic application testing, um, going through and doing uh, library analysis and various other things. Um, but the sad kind of reality of it is, is that um, one, you're never going to be able to, to scan yourself safe. That, that's just fundamentally not how it works. I mean, there's the no such thing as a hundred percent security. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's not only that. It's that uh, these tools are. Uh, you know, some of them are very good at catching a couple classes um, of vulnerabilities, things like they may do a fantastic job of catching injection vulnerabilities, things like SQL injection or cross-site scripting or maybe command injection. Um, but there are other kinds that they may miss altogether. For example, you know, missing our broken authentication, encryption issues, um, or just genu uh, genuine kind of flaws in business logic. Uh, um, so these would require a human being to look at the code and determine that the, whether or not that's secure. Absolutely, and so the that's kind of the first part is is because this is a black box. We've kind of tried to find software and things to do it, um, but the second part of it is is that if you're fundamentally focusing in on the application, the security of the application, you're missing how those bugs are getting into the software. And that's, you know, by educating the developer and getting down to that route where you're working with the developers from a cybersecurity standpoint, you get so much closer to closing that loop. You get developers to think about security, less of those bugs get into software. Well, that makes sense. I think early in my career, I sort of thought of myself as distinct from the security team. I thought, I'm going to write the code, and the security will kind of bolt on security later on. And I think we're in a room what you're saying is that 
that's not that's the wrong attitude. Security should be built into the process of actually building the software. Absolutely, and it, it kind of you know it's funny that you bring it to that point. For a long time, we were kind of missing the model for what developer what where security people fit into the development cycle, and so we had this kind of concept of the red and blue team, um, and then in a uh, amazing post a couple years back. Um, uh, Louis Kremen, I think I'm pronouncing his name right, introduced the InfoSec color wheel. And it basically points out that there's this whole wealth of space that we're completely missing by leaving the developers out of this. And so he went on to define kind of the, the red and blue teams as we know it, the operations team, people going through there, and then but created this kind of yellow team. And the yellow well, team you, represents... Before you go, can you certainly. define the red and the blue team, please? Certainly. Uh, so our red team are our attackers. They are the people who um, fundamentally, they're penetration testers. There are cybersecurity people who go in and actively try to break the application in the same way that our external attackers would do. So they, to be bad guys. they pretend to be the bad guys. I, you know, I, I get to laugh every once in a while. I get to put on my black hoodie and go and try and test out applications and do the mean, nasty things. But, um, but contrast to that, we have the kind of blue side, and the blue side are in kind of more of a traditional sense, our operations people. These are the people who are trying to secure it on a daily basis and to try and make sure that our applications stay up running, make sure that we're not leaking data, make sure that we are holding the uh, CIA triad confidentiality, integrity, and availability of an application together. Um, and then this idea that those two groups can work together kind of gave us this concept of the purple team. And for a long time, that kind of held for the cybersecurity community. But it, it kind of misses that point that exists in there, which is the development team inherently as they're building these pieces of software, custom software, they fit somewhere into that cycle. And so they expanded it out and kind of added the yellow team. And the space that I actually occupy and kind of uh, work in is this orange team between the red team and our developers. And my job is to educate, inform, help, set pace um, and remove all of the magic from what hackers are doing. Educate the developers. Absolutely. Uh, so you're the orange team. You're essentially the education team. What's the yellow team? So the yellow team are our developers and builders. So in the security ah. model, because at the end of the day, security is everybody's job, right? Okay. Um, it, security functions uh, or breaks whenever they find the weakest link. And it doesn't matter where that person comes from in the portion, the side effects or the end effect is the same, right? And so the idea that security is everybody's job, now that we include the yellow team, the builders, the software developers, the architects, um, as part of that, we now can have a much larger conversation about how everybody contributes to cybersecurity. Well, let's talk specifics then. What are some of the things that uh, a developer, for example, can do to implement better security? So there, there are a handful of things that we can go in. The first one is just, um, you know, raw education. And I say this, um, you know, if you've never gone out and gone through and looked at the OWASP top 10, it understand what it is. It's a marketing tool for cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. But that goes through and kind of gathers together what they think the top 10 most important security issues are. Understand how they work. Um, there are some fantastic tools out there like DVWA, OWASP Juicebox, um, BW Apps that will allow you to kind of go through and test. These are all um, intentionally vulnerable applications. And so they, you, they give you walkthroughs. You can go through and test all of these and see how these um, attacks work. And by understanding how they work and kind of understanding the pieces, you can also flip over because these are all open source products and look at the source code. You can see where the issue came into the code. So my first part is say, go out and do that. And, you know, speaking from kind of the, the standpoint, whenever I go to present at conferences, I portion of my or, uh, thing I go through and I say, hey, how many people have heard of the OWASP top 10? And at best, we usually get about half of the room. And, and that's kind of the, the tough reality of because at the end of the day, you know, shipping uh, security is not the focus of the business, right? It's ship, ship features. Right. Um, features sell. Features feature sell, right? Um, and so the understanding that this is a secondary portion of that conversation, 
um, understanding how those pieces work and how they fit together is, is pivotal. So I would say if you're going to start somewhere, start there. There are some fantastic presentations out there that will move you in that direction that kind of bring that out. The second thing that I would say is, hey, if you've never done any of this before, um, you, you want to start improving the security of your application, but you don't know what, where to start, I would say start with threat modeling. And I will give you the simplest path that we've got to go through for doing threat modeling. Simplicity it's asking, is good. asking four simple questions. What are we working on? What can go wrong? What are we going to do about it? And did we do a good enough job? So encapsulated in that, we're going through and saying, hey, what are we working on? What's the key pieces that we want to keep safe? Again, going back to that kind of CIA, uh, CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. What are the pieces inside our application or inside our uh, solution that we're trying to keep safe? What can go wrong? You know, and this may come from, you know, something as simple as what happens when somebody goes and trips over a wire and unplugs a server, right? Um, we can follow it all the way down to what happens if there's a lightning strike in one of the uh, data centers and it takes out the air conditioning and, and takes our app offline, right? Those are kind of the worst case scenarios, but there are tons of other things that can happen in that space and it doesn't necessarily... Um, we tend to think of cybersecurity issues as, you know, like I made the joke, people in black hoodies uh, hacking away in dark basements, right? Mm -hmm. um, but realistically, anything that affects confidentiality, integrity, or availability is inherently a cybersecurity risk. Hmm. And so kind of train your mind in on that and think of, you know, just the kind of everyday things, what can go wrong. Then you shift to the third part and it says, hey, what are we going to do about it? You know, if we're afraid that somebody could get access to a portion of the data that's sensitive, do we have logging there? You know, and then finally wrapping it all up and bringing it back going, hey, we went through and we did some stuff. Did we do a good enough job with it? Do we feel comfortable that what we have in place will make our application more secure in that way? Interesting. Um, it's not, I do like the simplicity of that because it's, it's, it flows logically from solving just about any problem. Uh, not even IT related, much less security. Um, can you? Uh, I want to get back to this: um, the idea of application security versus developer security. What mm -hmm. what is the difference between the two? So, uh, you know, whenever we kind of talk about AppSec, we talk about the kind of old view of the world. And if you've heard anything from the kind of DevSecOps world, this is what we're talking about. Whenever we talk about developer centric versus application centric security. Okay. Um, the developer centric security, you know, goes right back to the DevSecOps uh, manifesto, things like leaning in versus saying no. I don't work for the Department of No, and I know a lot of people who have worked with cybersecurity in the past, right? You've had the, the Department of No, like, hey, that's not going to happen. Um, you need to go find something else to do, right? Um, I don't take that standpoint. I have no ability to tell a team that they can't do something which changes my mental space where I have to figure out how to help them do it safely. Um, and that's, that's pivotal in bringing the development team to the table for cybersecurity on a level platform. Okay. I, I think I can think of an example of that, like uh, just moving your, your application from on-premises to the cloud. Clearly there are risks involved in doing that, or even maybe making your application available as a web application as opposed to an internal. Uh, rich client application. Uh, there's risk to that you're exposing to a broader audience. You could say no, <laughs> just let's not do that, or you could acknowledge yes, we, there are costs to doing that, and there are risks, and that we can ways there are costs of mitigating those risks. But, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, if you want to bear those costs, yes, we can do that. And that's I mean it's a simple example, but uh, you know with a countless number of <laughs> security risks out there and. and things people want to do with applications that you can apply the same logic. Absolutely. Um, kind of moving it to the next step, you know, we don't want to be in a position where we have, you know, we're enforcing checklists as part of this process, right? Um, mm -hmm. The thing about checklists is they, they kind of lull us into this sense of everything being okay. That's well, we went really through the, checked. we went the, through the, the checklist goal, and everything the was on there. The checklist rather than actually securing yep. the application. And so what the shift then is, is to, you know, again, 
going back, you know, those AppSec tools do have a place, right? Um, and the thing is, is that you can integrate them as part of the process. And as long as you're integrating them as part of the process and understanding that they are responsible for kind of carrying forward that moving goalpost, um, cybersecurity is always moving. Things are always getting more challenging. Things are, um, the more information there is, inherently there's value information, the more people there are trying to take that information, right? And so whenever we talk about that, if we can implement those tools in such a way that it helps us get a good understanding of how we're moving, trending up and down, then that's absolutely a great way to include that. But we kind of switch that out um, and away from the checklist into that. Um, talking about doing things like, um, you know, we want to create and make data available to people as part of this process, okay? Um, cybersecurity challenges are always out there. And so what we try and do is we try to utilize information coming from those tools. Maybe it's uh, libraries, information coming from CISA. Um, uh, CISA is the, oh, I, it's the one thing I didn't look up. It's the uh, American um, Computer Information Security Agency. I think it's something in that ballpark. I'm looking it up right now. It <laughs> it's CISA.gov. Uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. There we go. Um, and they release a list of like the the top most uh, exploited libraries and vulnerabilities, right? Got it. It looks and like it's a government agency. It's, it is a government. The website is CISA.gov. Yeah. Um, and so what we do is we try to take that information and put it into perspective for the teams, right? and try to help them understand, you know, what security looks like from that standpoint. And whenever we give them access to information that they're getting as part of that, we feed it back through that loop so that they can make decisions based on what they're seeing. Um, you know, and the last, last kind of big piece that I would really hit in this space is the key is to share intelligence. Um, we, I talk with my developers constantly about the kinds of things that we are seeing out in the wild. Um, but it's also important, you know, a uh, security incident is one of those things that's going to happen. Like there, in this day and age, uh, maybe 25 years ago, you could kind of slip under the radar, but at this point in time, you're going to be a target of something. Okay. Um, and so really how you react to that is far more important than what actually happens in that moment. Okay. Um, and being able to take any of those incidents that we have, I turn those into lessons learned documents so that we can feed those back out to the rest of everybody and say, hey, this happened to this group. How do we give that information over to other groups to help them gain that knowledge so that they can work that out so that we can share the learning as part of that? Oh, that's, uh, uh, we started with education and now you're, it's coming first, full circle that. I think originally your education was talking about being proactive, and now you're talking about being reactive. Absolutely. Uh, very cool. Is there anything we haven't covered on this topic that you think we should? Um, I would just welcome people to kind of hop into this space. Um, I will tell you that one of the cool things, if you're coming from the development community and coming over to the cybersecurity and kind of seeing that, um, the cybersecurity community produces great wealths of information for how to handle this and um, I don't know if there is actually a cybersecurity uh, conference that's run in this day and age that's not recorded um, and this is kind of a, a cool thing you can go out to uh, I think it's infocon.org and get access to just plethora of security conferences and access to all of these documents um, if you go out to YouTube you can do a search for um, you know, things like the AppSec Village at DEF CON. This is kind of the space where uh, a lot of developers may get the most value. Um, those are fantastic resources out there. And I would encourage people, um, I know whenever I present at conferences, I give away all my materials. Uh, not like it really comes from me so much anyway. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea is, is that I want people to take this information and share it as much as they can. Um, mm -hmm. Because as we improve in the development space, um, this is going to be, um, this is a place for developers to kind of step up and take that next step to the next space. Um, it's very different having a, uh, somebody who came from the systems engineering side coming over telling developers that they need to secure their code. It's very different when a developer comes in and says, hey, I've pushed production code. 
I've had to sit on that conversation and make the, the you know the the delineation of whether we're going to ship tonight or whether we're going to ship two weeks from now to fix the security issue that may or may not be there, right? And so you you fought in that space, and uh, it's important for developers who have those experiences to bring them into the cybersecurity space. Do you have an online presence? I do. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Punk Coder, P-U-N-K-C-O-D-E-R. Um, Twitter's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. I try to respond to everybody who kind of sends me any messages. Um, I love to talk cybersecurity, and given the opportunity, I will talk to anybody at it, sometimes at great lengths. <laughs> awesome. I'm lucky that you're talking to me. That's for sure. I'm learning things. So, absolutely. Um, and, okay, so uh, the last question is, um, if, you're, uh, if somebody is interested in getting more involved, particularly developers are interested in getting more involved in the security aspects of application development deployment, what's, what's a good place to start? So there are tons of places to start. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, the challenge of this space is um, unlike in certain kind of developer communities where you're like, okay, where, where's that, that one gem that I need to find? Um, the problem is uh, kind of information overload. Sure. Um, you just you can get swamped by a whole lot of information in this space. Um, OWASP is fantastic. The OWASP website gives you an immense amount of information. They also have a Slack channel. Okay. Our, uh, Slack o instance. O -W -A -S -P org is OWASP. That is correct. Um, and they have uh, fantastic resources for developers to kind of move in this direction. If you hop on the, the board, people will be more than happy to talk to you about this. Um, you know, there are local OWASP groups. Meet up with them. Go to, to talk with those groups. Um, a lot of areas will have local uh, hacker meetups. Uh, I ran DC 720 for several years uh, out of Boulder, Colorado. Those are fantastic places to meet other people who are interested in security. And the key part that I would say in this is um, even if you don't have the cybersecurity skills, if you come as a developer, you already have many of the deep level skills that are necessary to succeed in this space. Mm -hmm. um, and in most cases, the, the, the groups are very, very welcoming, uh, especially for people who have those development skills. Um, so yeah, the, the OWASP groups, the DEF CON groups, um, I also participate and help out with the AppSec Village at DEF CON. Um, DEF CON is a huge uh, cybersecurity hacker conference that happens every year in August. Um, and I try, and have tried in the past, I should say, to take developers along with me. Um, it's important for them to see kind of what's going on in this space, to dip a toe into it and see kind of the interesting, playful nature of this side of the business, right? Um, because there are, uh, it's very easy to get overwhelmed by the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that comes with cybersecurity. Um, and when you realize that, you know, the people who are submitting bug bounty reports and things like that to you and your organizations, um, they're doing the good thing. Like, they may have come in and they may have attacked your site or whatever, but they're reporting it to you. They're not dumping it on a dark web forum somewhere, right? right. And so that's the, the key piece to remember that, you know, building those kind of communities and those ties inside uh, the community and working with those people definitely um, definitely is that first step in that direction. Excellent. Well, James, I really appreciate your time, and uh, I think it's been really education for me, at least. <laughs> Anytime. I, like I said, I'll, I will speak with anybody who will listen. All right. Thanks a lot. You stay safe. Will do. You do the same. Take it easy.